So that's how the community works. Thanks. <laughs> Um, thank you for being here. I know it's just after the lunch, but I think it's perfect. Uh, we are Autour de Minuit and ADV Studio from Paris, France. And uh, first, we're going to start off with some visuals. I hope it's a bang. Um, so that's a reel that uh, one of us over here put out just for the Blender projects. Um, so we made those. <laughs> uh, who are we? Um, we're going to be four presenting today because we wanted to make like a global overview where we thought everyone on the technical team should, uh, should speak out, pick up. Um, so we have Christophe Seux, who's our CG and technical supervisor. Uh, you may know him as the creator of the classroom that's been used all around for like eight years. Uh, we have Mario Howitt, who's a CG journalist and joined the company about a year ago. Uh, he's also the editor for Blender Nation, so he's kind of a know-it-all on Blender. <laughs> we still love him for that. Um, then there's Samuel Bernou, who's a um, CG and technical supervisor as well, and a grease pencil enthusiast, so he made uh, a couple of tools that he's going to speak about a bit later. And myself, Fiona Cohen, I'm a project supervisor, which means I'm a production person with a technical curiosity. <laughs> and I oversee pipeline and uh, the R&D department. Um, Autour de Minuit is a company that was founded 20 years ago, 2001. It's a production company uh, with Nicolas Schmerkin as the founder and producer. Ten years later, he created a studio in Paris. First it was in the center of France, but now it's in Paris, where we are, ADV Studio. And a few years later, Borderline Films, which is in Angoulême, so a bit, a bit more in the south of France. Uh, I put out the Moulin Rouge because we're in Paris close to it, so just, you know. <laughs> and um, we are a company that has been working on a lot of uh, films, uh, and uh, first for Autour de Minuit, uh, or with co-producers, but now we are also open to services, so it allows us to work on even more diverse uh, projects. What's our angle? Uh, well, so again, images, I'm gonna be a lot of showing a lot of things like that. Um, well, we're an independent, independent company uh, who's known for like impertinent, quirky, um, experimental movies. Um, and not really for kids, even though there's like a few uh, reindeers and such, it's really an exception for us. And uh, we've done CG, 2G, hybrid, whether it's live action and, uh, and CG or 2D, 3D, and also stop motion. We do sometimes the whole production, sometimes we do just one part. And so um, we've made around 100 films, five uh, series, seven TV specials, um, and recently we started doing feature films and it has allowed us to go to many festivals and win like 500 awards, uh, an Academy Award uh, 10 years ago, César, Goya, uh, Magritte, so many things that are populating the walls. Um, and you can see a lot of those projects on our YouTube channel, um, Animatic. Uh, we'll give the address a bit later. Um, 
The studio, uh, there's an image on the left. Uh, you can see Christophe, for example, talking with someone else on development things. So we use Blender. It's, uh, it's been around the studio since 2008. So we're really enthusiastic there. We mainly, like we use Blender for 90% of the things we do. Uh, it's at the center of a pipeline and it's really, um, it was a choice made, of course, for like logistics re reasons and production things that we all know, uh, but also because it's um, ideal for hybrid pipelines because it, allow, it allows us the agility to really um, do things differently for each project while still having this kind of uh, bone structure to hold it together. Uh, it's also easier to deploy and uh, accessible for both the teams and the devs. It's stable, which, you know, <laughs> kind of cool. <laughs> and uh, also it's been really uh, nice to work, in for, uh, work on for remote work, which we've all been doing for the last you know, three years now. Um, but above all, like myself, I discovered Blender four years ago when I joined the company and it really uh, is amazing for the community. That's what we're sharing these days um, because we can ask questions, share updates, um, share knowledge, which is just, uh, wasn't, I wasn't used to it. And um, over all those years, we have helped like a hundred artists make the switch to the software and I hope they're still on it and happy. <laughs> Um, yeah, on the right, uh, we have this creature, Bob, uh, which is actually a prop from one of Rosto's uh, short movies. Uh, Rosto may be known in the Netherlands because he was from here. Uh, he was a director who sadly passed away a couple of years ago. And uh, we did um, like a, a museum thing with uh, some of his uh, props and we got Bob in the end. <laughs> so that's kind of the spirit of the studio. Um, <laughs> We're gonna, yeah. <laughs> we also have like unicorn hats, but yeah, something else. I'm gonna uh, go over like uh, some of the projects we've made uh, to show you all the diversity and the evolution. Then I'll uh, leave the mic to the mic to Samuel and Christophe to talk about the tools we've developed, either for Grease Pencil or for 3D or for Pipeline, uh, which we have. We have a pipeline. And uh, then Mario will talk about the future of uh, productions, uh, especially for Blender, what we wish for, what we want, and what we do not want also. <laughs> um, so first off, uh, we had to start with a, a film, um, actually Babiol, um, a short and then a TV series, which was uh, directed by Mathieu Ouvray, uh, who is well known in the community for being the director for Cosmos Laundromat about 10 years ago. So we've been working with Mathieu for a long time. And Babiola was kind of the first, one of the first big projects made on Blender at the studio with a CG integration into uh, live, uh, live footage. Uh, so it's really part of the core DNA of the company because it's those little cute creatures doing absurd things and being run over and, you know, um, like from a landfill to uh, a table and just doing weird stuff. Uh, it's very funny, you can see a lot of it on, on the internet. Um, after that, um, Mathieu went on and, there's no sound, it's normal, <laughs> uh, went on and, and adapted a kid's uh, comic book uh, called Nono. Uh, there was Wee Wee and now there's Nono. Um, and he first made a short, then he made a TV series, all in Blender, fully Blender, with a plasticine stop motion look alike. Look -like. Um, yeah, it's running over. Um, and then we also made uh, a TV special um, with a lot of uh, waves and uh, this one, hard, very <laughs> hard to make. That was like six years ago. Uh, and then we did two other TV specials with another director. Uh, so this is from the last one, No No In Space. We had a lot of fun. Uh, the animators did not have so much fun with like the no gravity situations. Uh, and so again, fully in Blender with this stop motion look like, which actually uh, allowed us to win a prize at a stop motion festival. <laughs> they didn't really read the fine prints, but that's fine. Um, after that, we have Ronde de Nuit, which is um, a short film uh, by Julien Regnard, uh, we did in 2021. It was the first 
what well, actually made it in 2019. Uh, it was the first, 2020? I don't know, between, at least 2020 doesn't exist. So. Uh, it was the first short film we made entirely on grease pencil. So that allowed us to first uh, see what animators can do, what they like, what they hate, what they hate. And uh, Samuel then uh, designed the first tools for the studio then. Um, there, is, there are some uh, CG elements for the car and the sets. Uh, you'll see a bit of that in, um, in the later presentations. And uh, it was actually a success because uh, two of our um, animators really fell in love with the grease pencil. So, hey. <laughs> and they're still working for us. So, double hey. <laughs> um, then, Unicorn Wars, which, was, uh, which is one of the best things we've been working on the last few years. Uh, it's a feature film, the first we've made, uh, in co-production with Spain. And um, so it's the tale of, uh, well, I'm wearing the t-shirt right now because it's coming out in theaters. Um, so it's the tale of the teddy bears against the unicorns. Um, it's all cute and well, uh, but it's also very difficult to make because those unicorns, you know, they run, they run in pack, and we love animating four-legged friends in 2D. No, we don't. <laughs> so we made them in 3D. So it's mostly in grease pencil, uh, but the unicorns are in 3D, and we converted them into grease pencil objects for them to be reworked on by 2D animators. Uh, that's called GP tracing, and Christophe will talk about it a bit later. Um, so it's a hybrid movie, we, and uh, we, uh, we took the Spanish team and convinced them that grease pencil was the way. Um, and they've done everything on grease pencil. They had Daniel Martinez Lara also uh, to, uh, to help them. So it was a big effort, and uh, we're very proud of how it came out. And as you can see, it's not for kids. Again. <laughs> uh, and it's not just violence, it's also the theme, it's tragic, it's sad, it's emotional. Just go see in theater. It should be out uh, early next year in the Netherlands and most of Europe and North America and Japan. It's already out in Spain, and it will be out in France at the end of the year, 20th of December. So take your family without the kids and go see it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, then we also have another short made entirely on, on Gris Pencil, which is El After del Mundo, um, by an Argentinian director who didn't know anything about actually really making a movie. And so she allowed us to just take her hand and say Gris Pencil, and she drew. Um, and she worked with some of the animators that worked on Ronde de Nuit. And uh, it was actually one of those projects you don't even really remember that you worked on because it went so well. <laughs> so it just confirmed that Grease Pencil was uh, the best decision uh, for 2D animation at the studio. It doesn't look anything like Ronde de Nuit, so we are uh, able to do different things, uh, to go in different artistic directions. And uh, we did get a bit of help. If you can see, there's a bike. It's a nightmare to animate in 2D with a perspective and everything. So we did a 3D bike. And we converted the 3D into 2D objects, and it was amazing. And they loved us even more, the animators. Uh, right now, we're working on In Waves. So it's a feature film produced by another company, Silex Film. Uh, it's in development. It's an adaptation of a graphic novel by A.G. Dongo about uh, surfing. So, waves, <laughs> uh, constraints, <laughs> etc. We're actually just doing the technical development as of right now. That's why I can't show you anything that's not already in the on the internet. Um, and what we aim to do for this movie is actually to animate everything in 3D, work with geonauts for the waves. We're having fun testing those out. And uh, converting all the 3D for the characters and the props into grease pencil objects. So taking this tool we made for Unicorn Wars and just pushing it to the limit and making it better and hoping that there's even more grease pencil tools that will help us along the way. Uh, so In Waves should be uh, starting in production next year and out in about two years. Um, then there are many other projects just like Jean-Michel Le Caribou, again by Mathieu Ouvray. He just loves us, you know. 
Um, so the short was made entirely on Blender, but the series that followed in the second season is it production was not made on Blender. Um, that's one of those things you cannot, um, you know, control when you're not producing the things yourself. I mean, making the things yourself. Then there's Peripheria uh, that was done seven years ago. Uh, which is about emptiness and how the world just can uh, work without humans. So it's a lot of dogs running around and those dogs were made in 3D with a lot of um, fine tuning done on After Effects. Uh, we have to say we use a lot of After Effects because the compositor is not up to what we expect, especially for short films where we have to tweak so many things and do artistic weirdness all around and directors tend to love doing those tweaks in After Effects. Um, so, but Mario will talk about this a bit later. <laughs> and then there's Swallow the Universe more recently, which is kind of this weird adventure into weirdness um, by Nieto, <laughs> uh, who is a real artist. Um, and um, it's a mix of 2D, 3D, After Effects, Strangeness again, and uh, we did it on Blender uh, for all the animation, almost all the animation, I think. And right now we're doing his second short film and we're applying more 3D. So he's asking us to do more 3D and he loves bugs, like weirdness coming out of the software. So we're here for it. Uh, very <laughs> anxious to see what, what it all looks like on the screen. Uh, Absence, in a very different look, uh, is also a short film. It's a short sequence, um, and it's about a homeless person and how he interacts, or how the world interacts with him, actually. And uh, as you can see, it's a more political stance. It's a very different um, visual, and even more so when you put it next to the goose. <laughs> Four kids, <laughs> one of those rare projects. So this one is actually CG in, composited on uh, live plates. Uh, so we had to also have a stop motion look uh, with like those textures and all those, the feeling also of the animation that was stepped. We tend to love animating like that. It's actually pretty, um, pretty, um, uh, pretty cool. Well, uh, we can work really fast. And uh, we had a lot of fun working on those, you know, the cloth, uh, the goose with uh, this, uh, this fabric effect. Um, it's a cute short film. Um, and we're also working on another feature, but it's still early development, uh, Les Ombres or the Shadows, which should be done mostly in Angoulême because it's going to be 100% on 2D Chris Pencil. Uh, and there are more of the 2D people over there. So it should be coming out in the next three years. We're hoping to push the production next year. And uh, it's a really beautiful tale of uh, immigration in kind of a fantasy land uh, told by the point of view of the brother and the sister. And I cannot do those, uh, those presentations without mentioning that Samuel and Christophe both worked on I Lost My Body, which was produced by Xilam. Uh, so it was the early days of Bruce Pencil. So they've been, you know, nurturing those Chris Pencil <laughs> desires for a long time. Uh, and as a team, we also worked at another company for this uh, short film, which was uh, an episode of Love, Death and Robots for season two, entirely made on Blender with just, just like a little peach of uh, Udini um, for some effects. And uh, we actually um, offered the Blender solution, the director tested it out and fell in love with it. So again, it's a win. <laughs> um, and that's the best image of the short. Uh, it's the, the first short of the, um, the second season. I encourage you to look at it. Again, totally different look from what we've done with um, Autour de Minuit in ADV. Um, very much, uh, very much real and sci-fi, etc. But that's also what we love about Blender and working on short films, especially. It's how you can uh, make so many diverse things. So now I'm gonna hand it to Christophe for all the technical talk. Well. So uh, I'm going to talk about more about the pipeline and the tools uh, we developed. So I'm going to start with a, a very draft uh, overview of um, our pipeline. So if I had to explain it in uh, 
just one image, it will look uh, something like that. So we said it, we are using Blender as our main uh, 2D and 3D software. We're even using it for compositing sometimes. Uh, on the other side, we have uh, Kitsu. So that's the production tracker we use. Um, so Kitsu, in short, um, we are using it for a production manager to follow the progress of the current project. Uh, for a supervisor, it allows them to assign the task to the artist. And for the, the directors to see the image and make the review and retakes on it. And um, in the middle, we have uh, Gadget. Uh, Gadget is our uh, in-house uh, asset manager. So his role is to make sure that the pipeline, naming convention, and the workflow is as transparent as possible uh, for the artist. So it gathers uh, all they need to work on the same interface uh, without having to go looking in files and folders. And, and for me, as a supervisor, it uh, centralizes all script and make sure the pipeline is uh, respected. So I'm going to talk a bit uh, to present you the, the basic functionality of uh, Gadget. <laughs> so what is Gadget? Well, uh, Gadget is just an empty interface. So I made it that way that it can be fully customizable uh, depending on the project. Uh, and we can still share script between a project um, so that's the way I, I think the, the, the tool. So what uh, Gadget can do, uh, well actually it can do a lot of things because you can add any uh, script you want in it so it can do quite a lot. So I'm not going to show you everything obviously. <laughs> and for example, we are using it for uh, making, um, for launching and selling Blender, different version of Blender because there are so many versions of them and we, we love to test a uh, different version. So we need a, an interface to switch between a Blender version. So we are using it also for opening the shot, building the shot, play blast, play, and everything. And Gadget also provides an uh, object-oriented API, to, API to, um, to make our script uh, way easier and way simpler. So to get access to the, the tracker data, for example. Uh, so. I'm going to show you how it looks like for uh, an artist to open a shot. So actually the interface looks like that when Gadget is configured. So you have all the tracker information on it. And for an artist, you just have to go to the My Task folder and just select the shot and open it. So really straightforward. Uh, so Gadget will make sure that the right file is opened and it will build the scene if necessary according to the task. So I, sh I put some images on how the, um, how the, the pop-up, uh, the build pop-up look like, and the, the, the publish pop-up also. Uh, so I'm going to talk a bit about the, 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 the design of, uh, of Gadget. So Gadget is a, a dynamic config-based interface. So uh, I made it that way that I can change uh, the whole interface without having to change the source code. So all we need to do, depending on the project we're working on, is, is changing the, the config file. So we can uh, choose on which project, which button we want at which places, and which, which script we want. Uh, so I put an example here. Uh, uh, so this uh, example came from the film uh, Lefter del Mundo. We needed to, uh, to send a zipped uh, Blender file with dependencies to our director working in Argentina. So we, we, made, we need to make a first uh, a command line script, which is uh, what you can see on the left. It's just a, a Python regular command line script. And after that, you, you need to write uh, some um, and some configuration, so you can say the name of the command. You can also say the, uh, the path, where, where is the script. Uh, you can also put some argument on it. And you can, uh, with that, uh, uh, get uh, information from Gadget to put inside the variable to execute the script. So on the script, we needed to get the selected uh, shot on it. So in the configura uh, configuration file, you just get uh, all of this information inside uh, the variables. Uh, for the script. Uh, so, um, and also, as we can have different, uh, a lot of buttons actually, we can also uh, group them inside menu. Menu. 
so, um, so yeah, on, on that config, uh, I, I put just one, um, uh, one, uh, one command, which is a DOSI file, but I can add uh, any uh, description I want, and uh, Gadget will uh, make uh, this interface uh, based on the, this configuration. And after that, we just need to, to set up uh, on, the, on the bottom of the, the configuration the, the location where we want to, the button to be. So that's the basic idea behind Gadget. I hope it wasn't too condensed, uh, uh, because now I'm going to talk about some tools uh, I developed uh, recently. Uh, so I'm going to talk about the GP Tracer. It's a tool we use uh, on uh, Unicorn Wars, and we plan to use on uh, other production. So I'm just going to show you the quick, uh, a quick overview of it and how it's, uh, it's working. So we're always trying uh, to, to improve our workflow for the artist to have more artistic control possible. Uh, so that's the goal of the GP Tracer is to, to combine the power of a grease pencil uh, with the flexibility and modularity of 3D. So I came out with this idea to convert a 3D render and make it a fully editable grease pencil object. Uh, so you can see on this schema, uh, on, the, on the left I have the, uh, a 3D render and I use Freestyle to convert uh, the stroke. Then I use Python to convert this stroke on, into grease pencil. And I also use cycles for rendering the lighting, uh, the solid color and the cast shadow. And actually, there is a, a function inside Blender which allows you to convert uh, an image to, uh, to Grease Pencil, which is called Trace Image to Grease Pencil. So I, I use a lot this, uh, this operator to convert uh, images from cycles to, uh, to Grease Pencil. Uh, and now, uh, it's a, a video of uh, how it's uh, working on a shot of Unicorn Wars. And for this demo, I'm just changing the color of the light and also uh, overriding some parameters uh, per material just to change the, the color of the unicorn. And then we need to trace the whole, uh, the whole sequence. And from the camera, it can look really uh, 3D, but when you start moving around the scene, uh, you will see that it's actually a 2D, uh, 2D render, and so it's a fully editable uh, object that we can uh, further tweak uh, by artists afterwards. So uh, why do we need editability when doing NPR uh, render? Um, because yeah, we, we oftentimes need to fix some issue we have with uh, line rendering because a lot of the time we have some flickering uh, issues so we really want it to be able to fix them really uh, quickly. So Grease Pencil has a lot of tools to fix uh, stroke and to, to improve the, the drawing. So we use that to fix some issue on the, the convention. And on that example, we can also use the, the, the power of the Grease Pencil with the, the brushes and everything to actually improve a lot uh, the drawing, adding some texture on uh, stuff like that. So uh, now I'm going to talk uh, uh, on a different uh, add-on uh, I did. Um, uh, so, yeah, um, uh, rigging is a, uh, another area uh, I'm in, in, interested in. Um, I always try to to improve the life of 3D animators. So, as we all know, 3D can sometimes be really a mess of uh, controllers. So I develop an add-on. Uh, called Rig Picker to make a 2D interface to, to make the scene a bit more clean and to give a way to, for the animator to interact with the rig without having to try to select the good controller inside a scene like this. Uh, so here is the demo on the, um, the mascot character of Nonon. Um, so you can see on the, the 2D interface, we can uh, select the bone uh, from that interface. Uh, we can use it for just visualizing, visualize the selected controllers. Um, we can also uh, execute script to like do bas basic EK, AK switching. And basically, on this in that interface, you can put ev every operator that you want. For the demo, we use selection set, for example. 
and you can also drag uh, selection to select multiple bones, and you can actually uh, also hide and unhide control controller with a double click on it. And uh, with this interface, actually, we can uh, work without seeing the rig, because if you know the rig enough, you can just select the controller inside the 2D interface and work in full screen with the rig uh, hided. Uh, okay, so that's it for me, uh, and I'm going to, to let you with uh, Samuel Bernou, which are going to... Thank you, Christophe. Uh, so, I'll be talking about the tools, uh, some tools I made for Grease Pencil. So, let's start with uh, two main ones, uh, Grease Pencil tools and GP Toolbox. They can be confusing because about the proximity of the name, but uh, the first Grease Pencil tools, it's actually built-in uh, built Blender. It's uh, shipped with it, you just have to activate it. And it's uh, some tools that the Grease Pencil team deemed worthy enough to be integrated to, into Blender, so I'm honored. <laughs> and then there is the GP Toolbox. It's our in-house uh, uh, add-on that we develop continuously across the production. Um, so the animators ca can have the best workflow uh, possible for animation. And um, those two add-ons work together. So let's start with the Grease Pencil tools. Um, it's like the essential package. Because you have, um, when an animators, um, uh, 2D animators open first Blender, the first question is, uh, how can I rotate my canvas? Well, this is integrated. Uh, you, you can rotate in free view. You can rotate in camera without selecting the camera and press R. So that's fine. And the second question usually is, uh, how can I flip my drawing? So this is in integrated as well. And the third question usually is, um, where is the, you know, the control T we have in Krita, you know? Uh, so yes, you, you have the box deform tool uh, that mimics this behavior. And also some bonus like uh, the ability to straighten a stroke, uh, pop-up timeline um, scrubbing uh, features so you can work in full screen without uh, having the timeline above, below. So here is a demo of the Grease Pencil tools um, in uh, showcasing a shot of uh, Ronde de Nuit, uh, a hybrid shot with the uh, Grease Pencil parented inside the 3D car. So we can see here the pop-up of the timeline uh, that is used to uh, also snap onto the key uh, as, uh, as I scrub in the timeline. Then I rotate the canvas to align the view how I, wa how I want. And then selecting the strokes, I can use Grease Pencil uh, box deform to uh, just create an in-between uh, for the movement of the arm here. Here I'm just uh, adjusting the subdivision so I can have a, a smoother results. And yes, the in-between is created as I want it, but I'm not an animator. <laughs> <laughs> so next, um, the GP toolbox. So. Uh, the in-house uh, tool, which is public. You can uh, go onto the GitLab and download it. Uh, what's in the box except the big sidebar panel? Well, a lot of things, actually. Like uh, all over Blender, a lot of little things. And uh, I won't have the time to cover it all, but let's see some of them. Uh, first, a big set of preference. Uh, preference and a set of shortcuts, uh, because 2D animators need to have like a all the, uh, the basic settings they need uh, right away when they start to work. And here is just a, a little uh, batch checker they can enable um, according to their own preferences. Um, first, uh, we need to expose the most used feature. Uh, for example, the camera switches, all, all that is related to the view, like the passepartout, the zoom level, the access to the reference without going uh, deep into the interface to bring the the uh, camera um, background images, and uh, as well as important object properties like uh, in front, uh, they always switch this one and um, edit the line opacity. So this is the main part of the panel. Then we need to make a bit of context uh, because uh, 2D animators don't work the same way 3D animators uh, do. Uh, there are a refining process of starting with 
uh, rough drawing, and then going into the tie down phase, then a clean, then a color layer, then uh, apply tones, and you, you get the final image. And that's why uh, we needed to have things organized. So to keep things tidy, we have a prefix uh, system. And uh, here in the preference, we have some uh, prefix and suffixes that are loaded by the, uh, that can be set by the user or set by a uh, gadget when we launch uh, the, uh, uh, when we launch uh, through, uh, through gadget. And, and that's useful because uh, it can help artists know what, what's going on, well, which layer relates to what, and also for us uh, on the pipeline side, uh, give the ability to script things, uh, like uh, export everything at once, like all the color layer uh, at once, for example. We have also in uh, GP Toolbox a palette linker, uh, so there is a library blend that uh, serve as a source for the materials, and so everything, every grease pencil object that is in this blend is listed as a palette, and that way we can just quickly uh, uh, throw a palette uh, through the active grease pencil selected objects. And uh, there is a little fuzzy search system that you allow to quickly have the right palette from the active uh, objects, according to the name. And also, we have to tackle the fact that it's in the 3D space. Uh, animators are used to 2D, and uh, they never heard about that third axis you all kept, keep talking about, <laughs> you know? Uh, so we have some tools to correct, um, to help with that, and to also fix some errors that could be made. Uh, so I'll just go, go on with that. So for example, here, a shot from Unicorn Wars. You can see there is a butterfly going rogue here. Uh, because it start, it's deforming over time. And this is because the canvas wasn't aligned. It's, uh, it was, um, uh, it's an anamorphic drawing uh, because, the, because of this wrong alignment. So here, first, I disabled the animation, found the key where it was correctly drawn, and then we have a realign tool that will uh, rotate the object so it's facing front and reproject everything on the right canvas. So now the animation is properly reprojected, I can re-enable the animation and play again, and the uh, butterfly are aligned. <laughs> oh, that's better. Now about another tool, uh, still about this uh, idea of a 3D space, uh, the background plane manager, uh, because um, this is mostly a tool for the layout artist, uh, actually, uh, because uh, it's needed to uh, slice the background um, PSD file, for example, we have uh, into different uh, depth uh, in space. So they have a tool where they can just reorder uh, right away. They can move the depth uh, of it. Um, and then it's also useful for animators because they can uh, change the opacity when they want to see more of the background, if, the, if it's, uh, the, it fits their drawing. Uh, they can also, as well, uh, just send um, and a, a grease pencil object to a background image plane uh, without uh, actually changing the size within the camera view. This is an example here, just uh, selecting send to plane, and you see uh, at the back that the, the size didn't change because it, the scale was updated, so, um, so it's still fitting. And this is useful to, for uh, the parallax of the shot to be correct. And we can also parent uh, objects to planes and uh, some other useful feature and also initialize um, a grease pencil object at the, directly in the, at the position of a background plane to avoid the error I mentioned before of not being aligned with the camera. Uh, there is also GP render. At last, we came the moment of the export, and we want to be able to do all of this with just pressing the glorious F12. And uh, for that, uh, here is a little demo again. Uh, so I have all the layer organized with the prefix, uh, which I talked about earlier. Uh, here I'm doing some name cleaning um, to have everything outputted uh, as um, the convention we have for the project. Uh, then I'm sending all into the render scene, so uh, that way we can uh, just have all the uh, layers. And here I'm merging some layers because you can see all the pink one are the color one, and we want them to be outputted on only one 
uh, only one uh, sequence of image. So I'm merging them with some uh, tools, renumbering the outputs uh, in an, with an increment of uh, base 10, so that way we can insert some, uh, some other potential uh, addition later, and then uh, test render, and you can see that everything is separated as we want it. Now, I, I don't only do uh, 2D uh, tools. There is also a, a tool for the uh, cycle animation to be unfolded on a 3D curve. Uh, here, demo of, of it, uh, we, we can just select the armature, uh, create a curve, then it will um, just place the thing as we want in space, then calculate the motion uh, with the button for the right forward uh, motion. Uh, this here is sliding, is sliding because it's animated on two, so just the baking of the keys and um, everything works. But the feet are still sliding, and here you can see that on the mark as red, so it's the contact keys that needs to be uh, um, marked in the original walk cycle or run cycle. And that way, those keys can be pinned down so there is no sliding afterwards when we use the pin tool. And here's its work without sliding. And there's more because uh, I, as, a many, as well as many developers here, I guess, uh, I do also um, all the stuff on my free time. And there is two uh, add-ons I want to present uh, that are used in production as well. There's Onion Peel, an alternative onion skinning system. Uh, so here's an example with uh, uh, a shot of El After del Mundo. Uh, what it, it's about, uh, you can uh, have your um, skinning, onion skinning transformed in the world space according to the position of the objects. Um, and also you can uh, change the opacity of the skinning individually. And then you can replace like the shift and trace feature uh, we heard uh, on the previous talk. Uh, you can uh, just use the, another skinning, uh, which, which I call peel, uh, to, be a, to be used as a reference uh, to redraw on it. So here's a curtain was just shifted so it can be redrawn just a little bit different. And there is also as well the, the sound, sound waveform display add-on, which is public as well. You can uh, fetch on uh, GitHub. Um, on my GitHub, it's at, at pool USB, a weird name. And uh, this is just um, adding a sound waveform inside the anim animation editor. So it's uh, easier for lip syncing and uh, synchronized action. And uh, there is a lot of other tools I wanted to talk about, but uh, it's all merging and all activated at once, and let's create the ultimate workflow. <laughs> and it's a lie, it's a lie, it's a lie. It's just an eternal work in progress. And now I, I drop the mic to Mario. Thank you. How do you follow that? Uh, I'm not sure. So I'm here to talk uh, about what we have planned for the future and what we hope for the future for Blender. Um, after the, my colleagues showed you the amazing work they did. So first of all, it, it goes without saying, what we want to do is more. More Blender, more production. Here there are two projects that are currently in development. But our plan is just to push it even further. And to push it further, there are, we have two prime uh, directives for technical development. Efficiency and flexibility. Efficiency to be able to do more, and flexibility to be able to do it better. And before jumping into what we're going to do, I'm going to show two examples where these directives uh, were in play and influenced our decision making. First, efficiency. So as you may have heard, Cycles have, have been updated uh, in, since 3.0 into Cycles X, and it became super fast. At that time, we were starting production, we already started production on Nono, and we tested it uh, to see the speed, and it was 2.5 times faster. And as you can imagine, on 40,000 frames rendered over passes and layers and tests, we couldn't help but do the, commit the technical heresy of switching Blender versions in the middle of the project into a beta version even, and use, uh, use 2.0 beta in production because it was simply blisteringly fast. Another example of, of jumping into this new technology for flexibility at this time is 
the, the famous geometry nodes. So for this project, this was our first foray into geometry nodes to do the straw uh, model underneath the goose. So the goal here was to test out how to do a procedural model where uh, the, power, the, the, the power of geometry nodes allowed us to interact with it. Uh, the animators loved that, to be able to do that in the viewport, the performance was great, and to be able to change the hay and the, and the look of it uh, on the per shot. So this was one example of saying, okay, hey, this is something we don't do usually, let's try it out. And it worked great, and uh, as Fiona said, uh, in waves is in production, there are massive waves all over the place, and geometry nodes will be a central part in uh, developing this project. So that's how it helped us in the past, what we're looking forward to in the future. Hybrid animation. You may have noticed, but we kind of like grease pencil. So uh, we will intend to push that even further. And our vision for that, it was, and this is a recurrent theme uh, being uh, presenting on the last day. All the thoughts we had, the pain points you identified, have been mentioned before by uh, the likes of Daniel Martinez Lara and everyone presenting. So for example here, our, our ideal workflow for um, Grease Pencil would be one powered by geometry nodes, would be one with uh, interoperability for um, to be able to, to change the, the textures of the stroke on the, on the fly, to be able to generate stroke banks, texture banks, so then you can easily apply styles from one project to another. Here I did a quick and dirty mock-up, don't judge me, on geometry nodes to show, for example, how this would look like. So here I'm using the curve tool to, to, to emulate Grease Pencil. So here, for example, uh, each instance of the stroke has a variation of colors, and depending on the length of the stroke, it can maybe uh, look at a different part of the bank. And these simple addition would make uh, uh, changing styles per project so much easier. You could tell the director, okay, give me a bank of your stroke styles, and then you can apply it to other projects, and the possibilities are endless. But this is one example we, we currently face in our project. So fingers crossed. <laughs> uh, Grease Pencil 3.0. Um, the other big, uh, big talk that makes us all dream and also have nightmares is AI. So AI, the way we envision it, is at least in the beginning simply as image processing. We know that AI has a lot of uh, ambition to make 3D scenes and all of that, but simply in image processing, like the open image denoiser by Intel, it's already incredibly powerful. So if we have access to be able to use the upscaling models, the interpolation models, that would already be hugely beneficial to our pipeline, and we're already investigating that using, for example, Chainer, which is an open source tool, which allows you to quite beautifully load models and then simply chain uh, their inputting images, outputting images, and chain these operations. Again, quick and dirty mock-up, don't judge me, of how it might look like in Blender, how we envision it. So for example, why, why not uh, imagine uh, uh, NN, Neural Network Loader Node, where you would load uh, uh, neural network models that are specifically done for image processing, of course, and uh, upscale an image, and then style transfer, etc. As a bonus, I typed into stable diffusion, person dreaming about AI in Blender, and apparently that's what the AI think it looks like. <laughs> and last, but not least, I think the goal of everyone here, is the holy grail the all-in-blender pipeline. So as you, again, as mirrored uh, in our talks previously, there are some pain points identified at the end of the, uh, of the workflow uh, and in compositing. So some people are reluctantly having to use After Effects, Nuke, uh, Blender Bob mentioned it, uh, Lefe Special have to use After Effects and us too on a lot of projects. We've tried to use, we did the effort, we tried to use uh, com the compositor on the full project on no no. We did it, I cried a bit. So, but we're looking very closely at uh, the viewport compositor and the real-time compositor. This could be a game changer for us and for everyone, I assume. Once the multi-layer um, compositing is applied, this would be a huge step into getting rid of the pesky little, uh, <laughs> little software is lingering in our open source pipeline. And on this very violent note, uh, that's about it for us. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, thank you for the Blender developers for making an amazing software, for giving us the tool to do all these things. Thank you for the community. And if you have any questions, I don't know if we have the time. 
we have one question. Yeah, one question, if someone dares. It could be for me or for anyone else on the team, but uh, yeah? Where can we get uh, Unicorn Mars T-shirt? Where can we get Unicorn Mars T-shirt? I'll leave Fiona. Uh, um, go back in time. <laughs> for now, they're just for the team, but we hope to have like goodies when the film actually comes out. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you very much. We're available to chat if you have, want to talk about anything. We'll be around. Thanks again for coming. Thank you.